By the end of 1792, the newly formed French Republic's citizen armies had exceeded most people's expectations. The French Army of the North achieved a significant victory over a professional Austrian army at the Battle of Gemups on November 6, which allowed them to conquer the Austrian Netherlands by the year's end. However, the fortunes of war are unpredictable. Just four months after Gemups, the once victorious army found itself retreating back into France. This was due to their defeat at the Battle of Neerwinden on March 18, 1793, and the subsequent betrayal of their commander, General Charles Francois Dumouriez, who joined the enemy. In Paris, the National Convention was deeply concerned to learn that their top general had committed treason at a time when coalition armies were advancing on all fronts. The fear of similar betrayals led the convention to tighten their control over the generals, subjecting them to the authority of the convention's representatives on mission. During the reign of terror that followed, this fear would make defeated generals highly susceptible to execution by guillotine. At this point, the convention needed to find a replacement for Dumouriez as the commander-in-chief of the crucial army of the North, and they selected August Marie-Henri Picot de Dampierre, a 37-year-old French officer who had demonstrated his loyalty by refusing to join Dumouriez's conspiracy. Dampierre was a notable figure in that he was the first French commander-in-chief to attain his position based on merit rather than social status. Just ten months earlier, he held the rank of colonel in the 5th Dragoons, but he had rapidly advanced through the ranks by distinguishing himself at the battles of Gemaps and Neerwinden. Despite his previous admiration for Prussia, Dampierre was now resolute in defeating the Prussians and all other coalition nations threatening France. Given command over both the Army of the North and the Army of the Ardennes, Dampierre led the reoccupation of the Camp de Famers near Valenciennes on April 15, 1793. Facing the challenging task of defending a long front, Dampierre had to spread his troops out widely. General de Harville commanded 10,000 men guarding the French right flank between Maubuge and Philippeville, while another 10,000, under Comte de la Marlière, held the left flank, entrenched at Castle. The majority of Dampierre's forces, around 30,000 men, remained with him at Famers, while additional troops were dispatched to secure the fortified towns of Valenciennes, Le Quesnoy, Condé, Dunkirk, and Lille. The French, outnumbered, poorly trained, and stretched thin, had no other option but to await the advancing coalition armies. As Dampierre organized his troops for the defense of France, the coalition army initiated a slow advance into French territory. On April 8, the coalition forces began to lay siege to Condé sur Alescau, a French fortress held by a garrison of 4,300 men. However, their progress came to a halt here. The overall commander of the Northern Coalition forces, Prince Georges of saxe coburg salfeld displayed a deliberate approach and didn't rush his offensive. He was naturally cautious and hesitant to take action without orders from Vienna. Coburg recognized that the French armies were poorly supplied and stretched thin across multiple fronts, with their coastlines threatened by powerful British warships. Time was in his favor, and with each passing day outside the walls of Condé, his forces continued to grow in number. As of April 23rd, Coburg had under his command approximately 60,000 soldiers who were involved in the blockade of Condé sur Alescau, consisting of troops from various coalition forces. On the right flank, there were 6,000 Dutch troops and 3,000 Prussians led by William V, Prince of Orange, stationed near the towns of Ypres and Menon. An additional 8,000 Prussian soldiers under Field Marshal Alexander von Novosorf were positioned along the Scarp River. Count Clerfate oversaw the southern part of the siege of Condé with 12,000 Austrian troops, who occupied the dense woodlands near the villages of Vicoigny and Racemus. Coburg's main force, consisting of 15,000 men, was directly engaged in the siege of Condé itself. Furthermore, the British, who had recently entered the war against France in February, had landed an expeditionary force at Bruges. This force was commanded by Prince Frederick, Duke of York and Albany, the second son of King George III. The British contingent included troops from Hanover and Hesse, in addition to British regulars. Coburg's army, poised for an invasion of France, represented the collective power of Europe's traditional regimes, with the intention of reigning in the newly risen French revolutionaries. In contrast to the formidable coalition forces, Dampierre had at his disposal only 30,000 battle-ready troops, and he might have been hesitant to initiate offensive actions. However, he received a stern reminder from the National Convention that Condé must not be allowed to fall, and he was strongly encouraged to take the initiative and launch an attack. The convention viewed Dampierre's reluctance as a lack of revolutionary enthusiasm, a potentially perilous accusation during this turbulent period when the guillotine threatened many.
As per the convention's instructions, Dampier initiated an attack against the coalition forces on May 1st in an attempt to seize the initiative. At 4 a.m., he launched an assault on the coalition's line, stretching from St. Salt to St. Amit. One column of his troops advanced along the Scheldt River, while a second column was directed against Count Clarfate's forces situated around the towns of Vicoigny and Racemus. Unfortunately, neither of these attacks went well. In the vicinity of St. Saul, the French soldiers, who were inadequately trained, were easily repelled by Austrian troops under the command of Joseph de Ferraris, who was originally born in France. Leveraging the momentum of his success, Ferraris swiftly attacked the French garrison of Valenciennes, which had temporarily left its fortifications to support the assault. Caught off guard, the garrison suffered heavy casualties, and the survivors retreated in fear behind the safety of their city walls. The second column had a somewhat more favorable outcome. Managing to position artillery batteries on the heights of Anzin, which provided a vantage point overlooking races. However, as the French artillery bombarded the town, Count Clerfate personally led his troops into the thick woodlands surrounding racemans compelling the French forces to engage them there. Throughout the day, intense and chaotic combat unfolded amid the trees as the French launched four separate attacks and were each time repelled. After Clerfate's fatigued Austrian forces received reinforcements from fresh Prussian troops, the French decided to halt their attack and Dampierre withdrew his troops back to Famers. In the course of this battle, the French suffered a loss of 2,000 men and gained nothing in return. In contrast, the coalition troops captured several French cannons, one of which was presented to the Duke of York. Upon returning to Famers, the French forces were tending to their wounded when Dampierre received yet another directive from the National Convention. Once again, the Convention stressed the critical need to lift the Siege of Condé, and once again, they instructed Dampierre to launch an attack as swiftly as possible. This time, Dampierre opted to focus the main thrust of his offensive on Count Clerfate's position around Racemus. He had become convinced that the French had come close to breaking through during their previous attack. On May 7, Dampierre deployed token forces along the Scheldt to divert the attention of the rest of the coalition army, while he led the majority of his 30,000 troops back to Racemus. That evening, he commenced a cannon bombardment on the town. Coburg had foreseen Dampierre's impending attack. As the French soldiers advanced with their artillery fire, Coburg responded by sending the Duke of York to reinforce Clerfate's position and protect the town of Malda. The Duke of York arrived at 6 a.m., even before the main French assault had begun. He was accompanied by the 10th Hanoverian Infantry and three British battalions, including the 2nd British Guards, a unit that would later become renowned as the Coldstream Guards. This marked a significant moment for York, who had not previously experienced the challenges of battle and was now about to face a formidable test. At 7.30 in the morning, the French launched their attack. Dampier personally led the assault on Racemans, commanding eight full battalions. The Austrians under Clerfate repelled the French attack three times, but they couldn't withstand the fourth charge. Before long, Dampierre had gained control of most of Racemus. Simultaneously, another column of French troops led by General La Marlière captured saint Amand, which had been abandoned by the Prussians. La Marlière then dispatched a division across the Scarpe River to the Vicoigny Forest. From that position, the French began to set up a gun battery, which they intended to use to shell the town of Vicoigny, situated just west of Racemus. The morning's attacks had initially gone well for the French, and if they could hold their positions, the coalition forces would likely have to disperse, with each national contingent retreating toward its respective supply base. However, the French soon encountered a reversal of fortune. Dampierre rallied his troops and pressed on toward Vicoigny, where the Austrians were still holding their ground. During the assault, Dampierre was struck in the thigh by a cannonball, causing him to fall. His second-in-command, Francois de Lamarche, ordered a withdrawal, recognizing that the soldiers had become demoralized. Even after Dampierre's injury and Lamarche's retreat, La Marlière's troops still held the high ground above Vicoigny, posing a significant threat to the vulnerable spot in the coalition line situated between Clerfates and Novelstorff's divisions. Throughout the early afternoon, the Austrians and Prussians made repeated attempts to dislodge the French from their advantageous positions, but their efforts proved unsuccessful. By 5 p.m., hundreds of Austrian soldiers had suffered casualties in their fruitless endeavors to seize control of the wooded heights. Around this time, the Duke of York arrived on the battlefield and was welcomed by Prussian General von Nobelstorff. 
The general tried to provoke the British forces into action, downplaying the strength of the French positions and failing to mention the significant Austrian casualties from their previous attacks. In broken English, Noblestorff assured the Duke of York that he had reserved the day's final triumph for the British guards, suggesting that the Redcoats simply needed to make their presence known in the woods, causing the French to retreat. Misled and eager to play their role, the Duke of York organized the 2nd Battalion of the Coldstream Guards and instructed them to advance into the Vicoigny Forest. This marked the Guards' first engagement against Republican France. The Guards proceeded with caution as they entered the southwest corner of the forest, navigating through the dense vegetation and foliage while stepping over the bodies of fallen Austrian soldiers. As they approached a clearing, they encountered three nine-pounder cannons, which were manned by French light infantry chasseurs. Lieutenant Colonel Lothar Pennington led the charge against the French artillery positions. During the attack, the chasseurs' bullets found their mark in the British ranks, and the grape shot from the cannons caused the deaths of numerous men. The Duke of York noted that Colonel Pennington, without any orders whatsoever, decided to attack the battery and when he got close to it, he faced the discharge of three nine-pounders loaded with grape, which inflicted severe casualties on my brave soldiers. Major Wright, who brought up four guns and was not far away himself, mentioned that he wasn't surprised by the losses suffered by the Coldstream Guards as they had marched through the woods in a formation and in unison. Recognizing their vulnerability, the Guards, having sustained over 70 casualties and lacking support from the Prussians, withdrew from their position. Although the British attack didn't succeed, it had a significant impact. French General La Marlière, upon realizing the presence of the British guards, interpreted it as a sign that the coalition had brought in fresh reinforcements. Consequently, he decided to cut his losses and ordered a withdrawal, ultimately resulting in a victory for the coalition. The charge by the British guards also left a strong impression on Britain's allies. Jebhard Leberecht von Blücher, who at that time was a colonel in the Prussian Red Hussars and was present during the battle, later wrote, I have never seen finer soldiers. They marched with such determination and did everything within their power to achieve victory. On May 9th, Clerfate and Noblestorff launched an assault on the French entrenchments, taking 600 men as prisoners. However, they failed to capture any artillery pieces because the French cannons had been withdrawn and moved back to Famers during the night under the cover of darkness. The Battle of Reismes was a clear victory for the coalition forces, who suffered around 600 to 800 casualties compared to the apparent 4,000 French losses. The disproportionately high number of British casualties created tension between the British and the Austrians, with the Duke of York accusing Noblestorff of deceiving him. Some also held Colonel Pennington responsible for the losses, believing he had launched a rash attack despite recognizing the strong French positions. Despite any personal grievances the Duke of York may have had, he never formally lodged a complaint. General Dampier, who had endured his grievous thigh injury throughout the night, succumbed to his wounds on the same day. He was laid to rest in a redoubt at Famers, having led the Army of the North for only a month. His death may have been a blessing, as had he survived, he likely would have faced execution on the guillotine for his failures and had already come under suspicion of being a traitor. Dying in service to the Republic preserved his legacy, and his name is among those inscribed on the Arc de Triomphe in Paris.